This is San Francisco. Welcome back to San Francisco. Queers undermining Israeli terrorism is the Palestinian solidarity group formed in the Bay in 2001. Kate Raphael was one of the founders, and when Palestinians called for international activists to come out to see the occupation in real life in Palestine, uh, she was arrested there twice and spent five weeks in an Israeli jail before being deported back to San Francisco. She'll talk about the 20 years of organizing that she's done with QUIT. And she'll talk about Blue Star, the marketing company in San Francisco that worked with Israel's government initially to pinkwash Israel's death squads by promoting Israel as a queer holy land and erasing the existence of queer Palestinians. Kate Raphael is here. Kate was a member of QUIT for many years since its inception in 2001. And she's going to help us talk through some of the queer organizing that has been happening, specifically in the Bay, that has had a reach of much further than that beyond the Bay. Kate, I was going to start by asking you what might seem like kind of a dumb question, but pretend for a moment that there are no dumb questions. Why is Palestinian liberation a queer issue? Well, I definitely don't think that's a dumb question, and it's a question we're asked a lot. I mean, the first simplest answer is that everything's a queer issue because queer people are everywhere. We're part of every community, and everything that happens in the world affects us, and it affects us uniquely. I mean, I really do believe that, that, you know, being queer is not just about who you have sex with. It's really everything about you know, how you move through the world. And so, you know, as a queer Jew, I'm affected by this issue differently than a heterosexual or, you know, gender conforming Jewish person or, you know, a queer non-Jew. So it's really important to me to have outlets to work on every issue through all of my identities. I mean, I come from a time when the queer movement was newly emergent, you know, like ebullient after, I mean, I came out in about 1978. So, you know, less than 10 years after Stonewall and it was still a very radical thing to say openly that you were even lesbian or gay or bi in a straight dominated left organization. Some of them were openly closed to, to openly queer people or had positions like the revolutionary communist party, the so-called revolutionary communist party at that time, which, you know, had the position that, being gay was a product of bourgeois decadence and that after the revolution, gay people would be sent to re-education camps. And we were always in the position of being asked to work with them on international liberation issues that were super important to us. And so we were supposed to put aside the fact that we were working with people that, you know, who were calling for our cultural genocide. And so we had to have our own groups then. And I mean, maybe organizations are not directly doing that now, but it was only two years ago that I was in a meeting where an old leftist said, you know, where they had this long list of demands and issues that they were bringing in and queer liberation was not among them. And of course, everybody looked at me like say something. So I brought it up and an old leftist said, well, I mean, if we put in every issue, like everybody's going to want to hang their ornaments on this. So I think we really have to keep it kind of simple. And I was like, okay, let's back up here. Like, like, queerness and sexuality and gender identity are not ornaments. And the left still think that they are. So, 
So that's, you know, those are two reasons that, um, queer, that Palestine is a queer issue or queerness is a Palestine issue, you know, also, I mean, there's also the fact that so much of the messaging around this movement is religious based and so many religions are not open or friendly to queer people. And so, I mean, we need to work with everybody as much as we can, but we also need to have a space where we can be really who we are and make it clear that we're part of history, you know, that like, and because queer Palestinians are doing activism in their own communities and in their own way, and they can't always be as open as they might like to be about who they are or what they're doing, but they want to feel part of the international queer movement. And so much of it has been so hostile to them, you know, to Palestinians and the Palestinian narrative and still is for forever, you know, for as long as Zionism's existed. And so, you know, they need to see that people in the queer community are standing up against that in order to feel like part of the international queer movement. Yeah. And so enter Quit 22 years ago. How did Quit form? 22 years. That's such a sad, that's such a sad and proud number at the same time. Um, Quit formed, really, it was a re-emergence of a prior group that had been formed in, I guess, 1991 in the run-up to the first Gulf War, the first U.S. assault against Iraq, which was known as Desert Shield. And at that time, we formed a group called DAGGER, which stood for Dykes and Gay Guys Emergency Response. I came up with that name and acronym, and it's one of my prouder moments (laughs) because I, I you know, the idea was we had this um, poster that we silk screened of a dagger piercing the shield and the shield, the points of the shield were like racism, militarism, classism, capitalism. It was a bold thing at that time, for sure, to have an anti-war group. So, so we were working again to stop the war with everybody else, trying to stop the U.S. war against Iraq, but also to support Palestinian liberation. We had several Palestinian members. And so we stuck around about a year, I think, after that war ended. And then, I mean, basically, and after the war, our focus was primarily in Palestine solidarity work. And that was during the first Intifada. Then after the, when the Intifada went on pause or hiatus or something. And um, during the Oslo years, you know, when the Oslo Accords were signed and everything turned in Palestine towards seeing if there was a way to make this into some real form of liberation, um, a lot of the movement in the U.S. kind of stalled out. People were in a very wait-and-see moment. The Palestinian-led groups were, I think, still working, but focusing on their own communities and not really doing outward facing work very much. So there was not as much for us to do. And so we stopped meeting and, you know, maybe continued to show up with our increasingly aged banners. Um, But then in 2000 and late 2000, when the second Intifada broke out, we were one of the first groups to really show up and start you know, mobilizing people to come out to demonstrations, the local Palestinian-led movement was still kind of in a process where I think internally they were trying to figure out, like, where they were going, you know, how they were going to take leadership of this movement before the movement really emerged to respond to and support the Intifada And a lot of the organizing then was being done by the Muslim community, especially in the South Bay. 
And there was a demonstration that we went to that was led by a group called American Muslims for Global Peace and Justice. They were out of San Jose. I think they still exist. And at that demonstration, we went to it with our banner that said, I mean, it was really old banner from 1991. And it said, U.S. out of the Gulf, Israel out of occupied Palestine. And pretty small down at the bottom, it had the name of a prior group that I was in or a group that I'm still in, but that has a different name now that was called Lesbians and Gays Against Intervention. And because of that, um, the security came and asked us to either take down our banner or leave. And when we didn't immediately leave, some of them tried to cut our banner. Like they actually took a knife and made slices in our banner. Um, the organizers of the march asked us to leave. A lot of people at the march, I want to be clear, and a lot of Muslim people told us, just ignore them. You know, what do they expect? This is the Bay Area. Um, and But we didn't want to defy the people who were leading the action. They had called it. It was theirs to decide what to do with it. So we did leave. And we were obviously extremely upset. Some of our comrades in the left also left and some chose to stay. And we remember who those groups were. <laughs> and, um, you know, we went off and we had coffee and we kind of, you know, collected ourselves and then said, OK, it's obvious that we need to start our own group quickly. Like, of course, we would have eventually started quit because we always wanted to have our own space for organizing, but that motivated us to do it fast. And we had the first meeting, official quit meeting in, I think, January of 2001. Just to recap real quick, the first two intifadas, these uh, Palestinian uprising against Israel that happened in the late 1980s and early 2000s, led to Dagger and then eventually the organizing of people and quit from the solidarity with Latin American struggles, Legay, that had happened since, was it the 1980s that Legay was around? Yeah, it started in 83. Although I want to say that even though it was originally lesbians and gays against intervention in Central America, Legay always had Palestine, solidarity with Palestine as a, principle of unity. Cool. Thanks for that clarification. Um, and then soon after quit started up, that's when the war machines behind the U S and then Israel started to understand the public relations power of having a uh, queer friendliness in their arsenal. One of the significant things that I think quit is known for, should be known for, is kind of determining this idea of pinkwashing. And I was wondering if you could kind of just briefly talk about pinkwashing and how you became aware of the concept of pinkwashing. Public relations has always been a huge part of what the Israeli government does to hide genocide and colonialism. And in 2002 and 2003, they were sort of realizing that their image in the world was terrible because they were killing and wounding thousands of Palestinians every month in mostly peaceful demonstrations. I mean, the Palestinians were having mostly peaceful demonstrations and being repressed extremely brutally and the world was not with them. And they started thinking about like, well, how could they build a different image for Israel? And they started what's known in Hebrew as a Hasbara campaign, basically a propaganda campaign to create positive feeling about Israel around the world. And as part of that, they, they had like some summits and they hired a, public relations firm that was based in the Bay Area, owned, I believe, by two gay men. And 
which was called Blue Star PR. And they started a campaign to try to win progressives over to supporting Israel with messages about gender equality, about all the gay rights and trans rights that Israel had that supposedly its Arab neighbors did not, and and to sort of create this idea that this is the only place in the Middle East where women can vote, and which is not true, in case anybody wonders, or where gay people are safe, and, you know, gay people can fight in the army, isn't that great? and create this idea of Israel as a multicultural democracy and surrounded by authoritarian religious fundamentalist regimes. So like we obviously got that, like when Palestinians go to a checkpoint, nobody was asking them, are you gay? And letting them through if they were not that that would be okay if somehow it were the fact that gay people were able to get asylum in Israel because it was so dangerous to be gay in their villages, which is absolutely false. I mean, they make that claim and yet almost no one who has actually applied for asylum in Israel, almost no Palestinian has actually gotten it. So, you know, many of them were living very precariously and dangerously in Israel. But they were making that claim. And, you know, we knew that it wasn't true. And we also knew that it was a distraction, that it was an attempt to just get the world to look away from the obvious facts that they were stealing land every day and they were killing people every day. And so... You know, we did some publicity, some actions that were aimed at um, countering that, one of which there was a film festival planned in San Francisco. I can't remember exactly when, five at this point, or six, that was called Out in Israel. And it was advertised. They took out big ads and bus shelters and stuff, and some of us decided to decorate those with some truth telling. And at that point, um, one of our members, Dunya Wan, friend of Quid and somebody that I've worked with a lot on other art stuff. And um, she came up with the term pinkwashing like that to do this is pinkwashing, which is actually problematic because pinkwashing was already being used by Breast Cancer Action, which is a great organization, to point to the use of pink ribbons to cover up um, corporate, basically corporate duplicity in terms of breast cancer and the ways that the same companies that are getting you to put pink ribbons on everything are actually marketing products that cause cancer. But be that as it may, the term pink washing, that was the emergence of it. And it became very widely used pretty quickly. A lot of groups picked up on it and individuals and writers picked up on it as a way to describe the effort to use, you know, supposed queer friendliness in Israel to distract from occupation and colonialism. This came around the same time as people were becoming aware of some of the greenwashing, the kind of environmental uh, friendliness PR that was happening around Israel. What moved you to go to Palestine? So, I mean, I have to say, I never really was somebody who felt like that going to another country to do solidarity work was never what I saw as my role. I always felt like my work is here to try to change my government's policies. I'm not great at language acquisition. Like, so I was not one of the people who spent a lot of time in Nicaragua, say, when we were doing that solidarity work. But in 2002, to 2001, when I was hearing about just the terrible violence that Palestinians were facing every time they went out to protest, and they were continuing to do it with so much courage, 
I thought, well, as a Jewish American, I should be with them. Like I have certain privilege that I could use to help maybe mitigate some of the worst impacts of the Israeli military. And I just felt like I couldn't not do it. And when I saw a call from the international solidarity movement to go as part of an international protection force, like, you know, an armed protection force or something in, um, in support of Palestinian activism, I just felt like that was something I had to do. And so I went on my first delegation with ISM in April 2002, and that happened to be like the day that we got there was the day that Israeli tanks rolled into Bethlehem, Janine Nablus, and Ramallah, um, and basically the refugee camps were put under siege, essentially. Um, that was when... About a week later, the siege of Janine, the invasion of Janine refugee camp happened where so many hundreds of people were killed and buried under rubble and the camp was more or less leveled. And so I happened to be there at that time. It was very intense. We stayed in one of the Bethlehem refugee camps mostly. I was in Ida and stayed with families we had a lot of time to hear their stories, you know, and everybody said, go home and tell people our stories. Um, and, you know, I was as a storyteller, as somebody who writes and does some journalism, you know, I felt like it utilized my skills. Well, I was, had a long history in direct action. I was a writer. I was a Jewish American and there weren't that many queers doing it. And so to be doing it as a queer, although I couldn't always be sexually open or, you know, be out about my sexuality in Palestine. I want to be upfront about that, but I felt like this was work that I could do that I had a unique role to play. And, you know, but what I did do, I mean, I was always open when I talked to U S media or foreign media about being queer. And I would always say that I was in quit. They didn't always choose to put that in their broadcast, but I always mentioned it. And I always thought it was really important to be doing it as an open queer. And so as out of my work with the ISM, I learned of a project that was just starting called the International Women's Peace Service that was recruiting 16 women who would agree to go for three months a year, for three years, to be part of a project that was starting in one village that would be based in one village and travel around the area doing, supporting nonviolent resistance and accompanying Palestinians to try to make it safer to go about daily life. I was accepted to that. And so that was um, what I did, I did manage to go my three times. Um, but I also, after my first three months, I felt like I had just been there just long enough to figure out what I was doing. And then it was time to leave. So the second time I went for six months at the end of which I was arrested and had to leave the country quickly. Um, and the third time I stayed, ended up, I had planned to go for six months and then go to Iraq for six months to do similar work. But by the time I would have left, it was too dangerous to go to Iraq. This was in 2004. And like the international projects were mostly not happening in Iraq because it was too dangerous. And so I stayed in Palestine for nine months and I was arrested again. And that time I was in jail for about five weeks and was deported. So now I haven't been go able to go back since. Yeah. Can you speak about how you ended up there in jail? And at the same time, there were actions happening around your arrest and raising the issue of both your arrest and the occupation, including protests in San Francisco so I got arrested at a demonstration. Um, both times I was arrested at demonstrations against the apartheid wall. 
um, in villages that became very significant in the struggle against the wall. The first time was in Budras, was one of the very first demonstrations in Budras, which became the only village to ever to get the wall successfully moved off their land through nonviolent protest as opposed to by going through the courts. Um, and there's a film about that that I recommend um, called Budrus, B-U-D-R-U-S. Um, the second time was in the village of Bilin, and that village also became extremely significant because they sort of created the another strategy around having weekly demonstrations with international and Israeli activists and using a lot of creative tactics and one in which they like dressed up as characters from the movie Avatar and um, sort of took, I mean, there had been a lot of demonstrations and consistent demonstrations, but they sort of took the idea of consistent demonstrations and media work to another level. So, but this was the very first demonstration that internationals were called to in Berlin. Um, I was arrested with, I think, five other internationals. And so that's how I ended up in jail. When I got out and I heard that people had had these protests, you know, demanding my freedom, it was a mixed thing. I felt embarrassed on one hand that, I mean, so many Palestinians are arrested all the time. There are so many Palestinian political prisoners and no one knows their name. And here people are like protesting, you know, about me, who's the Jewish American, who's like not facing any torture or anything. And, you know, was going to get sent home eventually. And, but it also is like, that's what solidarity is, right? That's what being in a movement is supposed to do for you. And it's a model for everybody about how you do solidarity and you have your people's back. And, you know, it, so it made me feel great that my people were so together and that they did an amazing job of organizing and you know, using it to bring in new people and using the fact that I was a member of QUIT to get people interested in QUIT. And, you know, and they did, of course, also talk about the Palestinians who had been arrested at the same time and bring awareness to their cases. Yeah, so, you know, it was just the solidarity that I got. I mean, I could not have done my work in Palestine without my friends from QUIT and other people Women in Black, San Francisco, which I also was a founding member of, you know, which stood for a very long time on Fridays in San Francisco. You know, like I couldn't have made any of the impact that, you know, the tiny impact that my work made without their work on the outside. And it's always the case. And, you know, since I came back, I've tried to do that, carry that forward and do that for other people going, you know, and that's like really the main reason for people to go to do solidarity in other countries to set it builds a bridge between you and the people that, you know, who might not get involved in the issue, except that they see you and you're involved in it and you're taking what they see as a big risk, even though it wasn't really that big of a risk for me. And you know, that might motivate them to do something that feels a little risky to them, like call their congressperson and demand a ceasefire or something. So this is how organizing works and how, I mean, incredible it is to hear that, you know, as Israel receives a $4 billion a year uh, in military aid from the U.S. and Congress just approved another $14 billion dollars that the Palestinian struggle can be uh, top of mind for so many people right now, in spite of those billions and billions of dollars uh, uh, that are flowing to the Israeli military and flowing to things like Blue Star or, you know, other programs that have taken the place of those early pinkwashing campaigns I think Blue Star may thankfully have like gone the way of Netscape or whatever. But thankfully, yeah. But there are certainly plenty of others picking it up. 
But I also think like that part of why people are motivated to act is because of all those billions of dollars. Like they know where those dollars could be going, even if we also know that there's not very much likelihood that they would go there where we want them to, even if they weren't sending it to Israel. But I mean, for sure, people get that, you know, that's our money. Right. So you've obviously worked in media for many years, uh, including many years at KPFA's radio show, Women's Magazine. And just as someone who has worked in media, I was wondering if you could talk about how you've seen media censorship on Palestine play out. I mean, there is nothing comparable to the level of censorship that exists around talking about Israel and Palestine. Like the way that every single word you ever use is scrutinized for like so-called coded anti-Semitism. You know, there's just no parallel to it. I'm sure there have been at times in this country and I wasn't alive during the McCarthy period, but in my lifetime, I have never seen anything like what has happened, not only in the last few weeks, although it certainly has really ramped up since October 7th, but I mean, the way that the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement has been targeted, you know, and that anybody allying with it, you know, and that certain words have been taken out of context to mean things that they don't mean and associated with so that, you know, then all they have to say is that someone used the word ethnic cleansing or used the word apartheid. And at the same time, I want to say that it is really noticeable to me how the word apartheid and Israel is now pretty generally accepted. And I see fairly mainstream left intellectuals like Peter Beinart using it pretty casually as like, this is a given. Ezra Klein uses it. You know, it's been basically accepted. And, you know, relatives of mine who are soft Zionists say, well, yeah, you know, I am opposed to Israeli apartheid, but then now they're balking at the word colonialism. But I remember when you could not say apartheid, and it was not that long ago, and Jimmy Carter, who had been president of the United States, was, you know, taken to task. I mean, his book was like almost banned from Amazon because it was called Israel, Peace, Not Apartheid, or something, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. I can't remember, but it was Peace, Not Apartheid. And you could not say the A word. And now that is like, not that contentious. And now ethnic cleansing and genocide and Nakba are the words that are, you know, being outlawed and, and triggering, you know, all these accusations of anti-Semitism. I mean, it is scary. I know for people who have less privilege and who are being the targets of these attacks and they are vicious. They are vicious and they are personal You know, people's post pictures have been put on posters, their home addresses put on posters. A friend of mine wrote a letter to the New York Times, you know, which you only put your name in your city. They only publish your name in your city. She got a personal letter delivered to her house with no return address or, you know, and no signature critiquing what she'd said in her, you know, 200 word letter. She was fine with it, but, I mean, the fact is that it sends a message. And, I mean, there was a great article, I thought, great article in Jewish Currents about how Palestinian intellectuals and commentators are being censored. You know, they're invited on mainstream shows, which is new. They haven't really, in the past, very much been even invited, but then they're given this very, very narrow frame of what they're allowed to talk about. And if they refuse to do that, then they're disinvited. And so, you know, I think the media censorship is super intense. And one of the most important things, honestly, that I think that 
as people here, we need to work on and really take the media to task for because it helps to create the conditions under which a people can be essentially wiped out in front of our eyes and nobody really does anything about it. Yeah. And we'll link to that Jewish Currents article in the show notes. Um, I also read that one. Uh, it's, it's a good one about, yeah, again, Palestinian voices being silenced in the mainstream corporate media in the U.S. And I mean, I myself coming also from a place of privilege uh, received my first kill fee, received a couple kill fees, which I don't know how much of a thing kill fees are anymore in journalism, but it's where you get assigned an article and you have a contract to write an article and the publication decides not to run it. And so then they give you a portion of what they had promised, though they have no intention of running it. And that was from this publication, Color Lines. That's Even, ironic. Yeah, totally. And this was like, as you said, the words, they matter. And I think you're absolutely right. Like seeing apartheid used in a way that people would have been scared to use like a few years ago. That is happening. And, you know, I just wanted to put that out there because it's so easy to feel that we're making no impact. And, you know, there's an argument for that, but, you know, I do want people to realize that we have had victories that like nobody ever credits your victories. I mean, if I have one thing that I like to hammer when I talk about lessons that I've learned, it's that no one ever tells you you won. And even you brought up Frameline and, you know, our campaign to get them to stop taking Israeli money, which they were taking a very tiny amount of. And I mean, officially, they have not met that demand, but unofficially, they seem to have for the last like 10 years or something. Not right. So it's like you never actually get told, OK, great, you win. Sometimes you, we are winning and we have to recognize those victories ourselves and applaud them and publicize them because nobody else is going to do it. As Angela Davis says, freedom is a constant struggle. Yeah, it's what people were hinting at when they were clowning the Biden administration for refusing to uh, use the word ceasefire because ceasefire is the word that activists have been calling out for many weeks and it would be too much for the administration to admit that maybe that activism had influenced where they're at versus where they were at on October 8th. So I also wanted to uh, mention that you have a series of books, although you mentioned maybe one of the books is currently sold out, but a series of uh, mysteries on uh, that are set in Palestine. Yeah, well, I do want to say that although one of them, the first one is right now a little hard to get in print, although there still are some copies floating around, but um, it's totally available as an ebook. So, yeah, I mean, as I said, when I was in Palestine, people were always telling us, you know, spending lots of time with us and feeding us and being extremely generous, even when they didn't have very much. And the only thing they asked in return was go home and tell people our stories. And I always thought, well, I could tell them, but I don't think they're going to listen to me or be very interested. So I was really trying to think how I could maybe reach beyond people who are already in the camp. And I, one night I was riding with some friends um, we were going to check out a situation that we'd been asked to come intervene in. And we were going through a tunnel that goes under an Israeli road. And I looked up and saw a car that seemed to be abandoned on top of the road. And there were some police there. And I said to my friend, oh, that would be a great way for a mystery to start. And I love mysteries. I read some while I was there. It was about the level of like intellectual stimulation I could handle <laughs> and 
the midst of the work that I was doing. And she thought it was a good idea. She started talking, like mentioned it to some other volunteers the next day. And they had ideas about, oh, and the body could be here and this person could be passing by. So I thought this seemed like a fun idea. And so when I came back, I spent, I took an extra month before I went back to work and wrote a quick first draft and um, then eventually, yeah, that became after quite a number of years um, of shopping it and tweaking it and various other things and writing the second, that became the first in the Palestine Mystery Series um, featuring a Palestinian policewoman and a Jewish American lesbian political activist like no one any of us ever met. Um, and that one's called Murder Under the Bridge. And then the second one, Murder Under the Fig Tree, came out a few years later. And, you know, while they haven't maybe become bestsellers, they have had the impact that I wanted of getting in some people to read them who didn't know anything about Palestine. And I've had people say, oh, I had no idea. And, you know, go and look, say that because of reading them, they went and like looked up stuff on Wikipedia or they like, you know, got a book by... Rashid Khalidi or Ilan Pape. So I feel like I, you know, have done what I set out to do. Yeah, when we talked to Deej in a previous episode that people can find in the archives, it's that's what it is kind of all about. Um, finding new ways to raise the issue, finding new people who once they they hear it, it's hard to unhear it, what's happening over in Palestine. If people want to find more about the Palestine Mystery Series or find more about your work? Easiest way is my website, kateraphael.com. It's Raphael like the painter. And um, yeah, the information about my books is there. Thanks again, Kate, and we'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to Sad Francisco. Sad Francisco is produced by Toshio Moronic and edited by Caitlin Wood. You can find past episodes at sadfrancis.co. Thank you to our newest Patreon supporter, the online personality known as JG Wentworth, not to be confused with the unforgettable jingle-having insurance company. See you next time in Sad Francisco. Sad Francisco.